not. She, she, she is. She's not on the uh, camera, but yes, she's there. Let go. Yvonne, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, good morning. And well, well, I shouldn't say good morning. I should just say welcome to everybody uh, to our Thursday uh, travels to the country uh, office. Uh, it's always very exciting to see people, new new faces, and the uh, our, our co familiar community. And everybody, we've had a lot of great feedback about how enjoyable and informative uh, this has been uh, for them. And as we always say, you know, it's the information that you will never find in a guidebook. So today we have Revati and Maggie from our South Africa uh, chapters, a uh, chapter rather, and uh, they are here to share with us what life is like uh, in South Africa. So I think, as usual, it's a discussion. So if you have questions, please uh, just unmute yourself. But if you're not speaking, we ask you to mute yourself. But when you do want to speak, please unmute. Or else there's always the chat box. You can put your questions in the chat box. And uh, I will call them out. And our uh, Maggie and uh, Revati will be happy to, to answer your questions. So now over to Rebeti and Maggie to introduce themselves and uh, take us to South Africa. So over to you. Just just one thing. It's Maki, not Maggie. <laughs> Maki. Um, yeah. also Maggie, so, but um, our chicken is Maki. Sorry. Um, so this is Maki. Hi. How are you? Um, and hey. this is Hi-Fi. Um, there's a the per, the member called Maggie who is supposed to join and then she's going to share about the schooling in situation in South Africa. So yeah, there's uh, one. Oh Maggie, I think Maggie just joined the call right now. So Maggie is also based in Johannesburg and then she's going to talk, later talk about the schooling situations on behalf of uh, everyone. Just to clarify. Okay, for those of you, just if I could clarify too, we have two offices in South Africa. Uh, Revati is in Pretoria for IBRD, and uh, Maggie and Maki are for IFC in Johannesburg. So we are talking about two different uh, uh, locations here. Okay. Who is going, Pretoria or Johannesburg? Uh, we agreed with uh, Revati. She would do, I think, a quick intro. Is she online? Revati, yes. are you going to say something first before I speak about schools? Because I have to leave shortly. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Um, here in prison. Talk it's slightly choppy Rithi right now. Rithi, your connection is here about five and a half. Can you hear me? No. Okay. Can you if the connection is bad and my Maki or Maggie has to go off for uh, jump ahead for schools, please. And then we'll loop back to Rabbit and hopefully the connection will be better. Okay. Maggie, would you like to quickly talk about uh, the school situations uh, first before you leave? Sure, oh, I'm happy to. I'm okay. Ready. Maggie. So I have Maggie. three. I have three kids, yes. Also here, yeah. Okay, Rafati. So I'm based in Johannesburg. I've been here for the last two years. I'll be two years in the next couple of weeks. In, we're from Kenya. My kids were following the IGCSC curricula, which is the British curricula. But when we came here, there were hardly any established schools that we could say we were confident to take our kids to. So we were forced by circumstances to enroll them in the South African system. So they're following the 
independent education board system, which is somehow run differently from the way the South African education system is run because they are independent and they are examined independently, say for one exam, which is at the year, at the end of grade 12, where they all see the national exam. So they've been following the IEB system. I have three kids, I have a son who is 13 and I have girls who are 10. It's not that easy to find a co-ed school. So if you're into co-ed, that is something that will shock you a little bit because, because for instance, my kids are in, in quotes, a co-ed school, but it's actually run separately. So on one, they are separated by a road. One side is the girl's school, the other side is the boy's school. So we don't even really get a sibling discount even if it's the same school. Education-wise, in terms of the level of education, it's not as taxing and demanding on the kids, which in a way is good, but I'm coming from Kenya where education is very rigorous. It's all academic. So it was a little bit of a shocker for us parents more than it was for the kids, but they settled in well. One thing they absolutely loved was the balance between education and sports. The co-curricular the co system here is really good. There is lots of drama, there is all manner of sports. I mean, I think you all know that South Africa is good in almost every, okay, not athletics, but athletics we keep it Kenya. But they're good in soccer, they're good in rugby. So that, is, that has been very good for the kids and they're very good here in swimming and my kids are swimmers. So that helped them to integrate very well. But as I say, the downside was the education aspect of it more for us, more than for the kids, that we felt was not demanding. To counter that, if you're able to financially, you have the option of going to the American school. For us, with three kids and with the bank only giving you 30, less than 30 or about 30,000 per child, and you still have to pay $10,000 one off to the school and you never get it back. So we were going to have to look for another 30,000 and then an additional, so it was just not adding up for us. Um, so that is why we opted to take them to the South African education system. That said, as I say, I cannot emphasize enough, if you're able to go to the American school, it's unmatched, it's unmatched. You can take your kids there and you're guaranteed that when you, when you leave South Africa and you go to another country, then it will be very easy for your kids to integrate. For us, we don't mind having the kids switch back to the British system if we go to another country. We are not probably gonna go back home, but if we don't, then they will go to a British system. And even if they go back to Kenya, they'll go to the British system and they'll somehow manage because mine are younger. Obviously, it highly depends on your own priorities. It depends on the age of your kids to decide whether you want to take the risk as we did to go to the South African system, or if you want to stick to the American system. Do not, I can't emphasize again enough, do not take them to the British system here. It is not established enough, and the facilities are not conducive for your kids to have a balanced education. They, I think they often have to go for sports in another school or in another facility because they don't have the grounds. But that's it, the situation can change in the next few years. So before you make that decision, just visit the school and be sure. But if you check online, the reviews are not good for the British International College, which is for the older ones, and for the little ones, it's a no-no. I'm generally very flexible, I don't complain a lot, and I knew if I go there, I would just be a can of complaints. That is why we opted to go for the South African system. I don't know if anybody has any questions, but I think I've covered as much as I can. The universities here are good. We may even opt, opt for our kids to go to university here. But also, again, depends on where you're coming from. I'm from, coming from Kenya. People come from Kenya to South Africa to go to university. So in that regard, we, are in a, we have got a soft landing that has helped us settle in as parents and for the kids to settle in. Mikey, how old are your children again, so that we have a perspective of your comments on school? How old are your kids? My son has just turned 13 and my daughters are 10 years old. 
when we came in, my son was 11 and my girls were eight. Okay, thank you. So does anybody have any questions about uh, education before Maggie goes? And then we will go back to Revati, who will uh, talk about Pretoria. Any questions about education? Yes, Beverly, go ahead. It's interesting to hear that the um, bank is not paying the full of the American school fees. And I mean, is that is that across the board, or does it depend on the type of contract? Or uh, you know, I, ha I haven't heard of that before. I don't know if others have. I will let the ones who are in the American school speak to say whether they go back to pocket. Uh, for us, we would have had to go back to pocket. Well, we, we can't, sorry, we can't comment about benefits because we don't know what they are. So unless somebody has personal experience uh, to answer Beverly's question, if not, we go to uh, Revati. Uh, I think, Kat, um, what do you call Barbara? Barbara, I see you're online. Are your kids not in the American school? They are. Hello, ladies. Oh, uh, let me quickly pick up this. Oh. Um, start video. Okay, hello ladies, yes. Um, I'm Barbara, I'm Swiss, my husband works for ISP, and we have lived in South Africa for 14 years. <laughs> um, our children went to a South African school for 10 years, a co-ed actually, and I must say we were, we were very happy. We eventually moved them two years ago to the American school because of the IB, because that will open up more opportunities for them. For us, the, the bank does pay the school, but there was an issue with how much per year that is paid. And somehow, because the South African school starts in January and the American school year starts in August, Somehow for us, it actually worked out with these uh, $10,000 that you have to pay beforehand and you never get back. Um, but, the, but the, uh, what the bank does not pay is the, is the bus system, and that is actually quite expensive for the American school. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, <clarifying. laughs> Hello. So I'll just add Hi. something. That, uh, oh, okay. so sorry, sorry, I don't know who it is. Um, uh, I'll just add something to what Barbara has said. So our kids are moving schools next year. We are moving them to Red Hill, which is 100% co-ed. And the beauty with Red Hill School, as much as it's IEB South African, from age 10, from grade 10, they can switch to IB. So we are moving them to Red Hill, and we are confident, even academics, they are much, much stronger than all the average schools. I don't know if Barbara, I'm sure you agree with me on that. Red Hill is like one of the superior schools. So yes, they, are, they, they have started the IB program since I think a year ago. So mm -hmm. we kind of be guinea pigs, but my kids will come in, will be, by the time they're switching to IB, the school will have been doing the IB program for a minute. So mm -hmm. I'm confident. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another question: Are the private school, are the school, South African schools, private or public that you're talking about, like Red Hill? Hundred percent private. Hundred percent private. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Sorry. Um. Can I say something? Hi. Oh, please. Okay. Um. My name is um Lee. I my husband is with IFC, so we're in Johannesburg. Um, thanks, Maggie. I think that was um, quite a comprehensive um, um, summary of what the educational system is. But I just wanted to include the French school. That's another option. So there's mm -hmm. the French International School um, in Johannesburg, and I think there's one in Pretoria as well. Um, we find it um, quite diverse. My kids, my kids are little, so my son is seven. My daughter is. Three. Um, my son started at the French school when he was three. 
And I think so far we're, we're quite happy. He's, he's bilingual now. We struggled a bit in the beginning because none of us is French speaking, but, but with some extra push here and there, he's picked up the language quite fluently. And then there's also, like Maggie said, lots of extracurricular activities that the kids can pick up as well. Um, music, arts, arts, drama, things like that. So that's another option which, um, which um, people who are moving here can consider. And Red Hill is actually one of the top schools. Maggie, that's just up the road from where we live. So <laughs> um, yeah, it's quite, it's quite a good school from what I've heard. Um, but I think for us, the French school gives you that um, advantage in terms of the language. So the, the, the child learns another language and then um, the system is almost similar to the British system in terms of the, when the year starts. So if you're going to have to transition, it's a bit easier on like the South African system where the year starts in January. Yeah, that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a very comprehensive uh, view of the schools in, in Johannesburg, uh, private South African, uh, American, and French. So thank you very, very much. Uh, Ramati, uh, maybe... Uh, Ivan, uh, can I add one small thing? Sure. Very small. Please, go uh, ahead. When, if, if one chooses to go the South African education system way, be careful to check whether the school follows a four calendar year or a three calendar year. So if you send your, if they send a child, say for example, to boarding in KwaZulu Natal, guaranteed it's going to be four, four terms. So the kids never are never on holiday at the same time, which can be very frustrating. How Teng primarily is uh, three terms, except one school, um, which is Crawford Private School that follows the four, the four calendar. All, all South African schools, the, the government ones, follow four terms. Private ones follow three terms. So that would be very important for them to pay attention to. Yes, that, that is very important if you want to go on holiday. <laughs> no, no, it does, because uh, otherwise it, it's chaotic. So, Ramathi, uh what about schools in South Africa before we look back to uh, everything else you were going to say in the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> yes, also, because Maggie has to leave soon. Maggie, yeah. do you want to also talk a little bit about uh, employment? Because I have no clue. I know there's been a lot of conversation with uh, people who've been here for a couple of years. Maggie, do you want to share that first? So I can share, and maybe after Revati you have spoken, maybe Barbara might have some wisdom based on her many years here. By now she must be speaking Afrikaans. So <laughs> when I did try to explore, I discovered that getting a work permit here is very difficult, and it's with good reason, and I wish many African countries would do this. Because of the many years of apartheid, they, of course, the the gap between the rich and the poor is it's, it's blinding, actually. So they have introduced what they call the black empowerment, economic empowerment, and trying to promote that more companies are hiring more black people uh, so that to give them a fair advantage in the marketplace, understandably. And by that, I mean not just the employment, but even in businesses. If you want to, hire, to outsource a particular service, then you need to be making an effort to hire a company that is led by the black community. And I, I'm, I'm talking this very loosely without enough information, so Rebati and Barbara and anybody else here, feel free to, to cut me short. So in terms of if I was to look, get a job, what I would need is for, to make it easy for me is a critical skills visa. To get a critical skills visa, there's a list of requirements that I would need to meet. I can present that to the VFS, which is the, the Foreign Service Office. I don't remember what the V stands for. We would then process it and submit it to the Department of Home Affairs, who check whether really I am offering critical skills that cannot be met here. Within one year, I need to find somebody to hire me. 
within that one year, so that within after the end of that one year, they sponsor my work permit. It is not impossible. It requires a bit of patience. And I personally, I'm, I'm more of in administration, so I know my strengths are not my strengths are not cannot not be found here. They they are available here. People in sciences find it much much more easier to get the critical skills data. And that said, I have not explored. I only spoke to um, the migration lawyer a few a few months ago, and then COVID happened, and I'm like, I'm not even sure I want to be employed anymore. I want to do coaching. I don't even know how I'm gonna do it. So it all depends on what you want to do with your life and then you can start exploring. But if you Google and look for critical skills data, you can see the list of requirements, what they use, and they check everything. And then you can see where you fit in and then start the process. You can do it on your own, you don't have to pay, because it's quite expensive to get, to, to get a lawyer to do it for you. Mike, can I ask you a question? You said it's quite expensive to uh, get a lawyer and you can do it your own. But do you find that you, although it's expensive, you would have a better chance of getting this critical skills visa if you uh, used a lawyer? Not necessarily. I know, I don't think she was able to meet, to, to join us. There's a lady who is actually um, an expatriate wife with IFC, and she managed to do it on her own. She didn't need a lawyer, and she got it within, I think, like two, three months. Another way of doing it, for her, I think she went the education way, so she signed up to do her PhD, and then, so it's married to your career progression. But still, you would need somebody to sponsor you after that one year. That is the key thing. Even if you get a lawyer to get it for you, after within one year, you need to get yourself a job. So for me, I would look at the pros and cons, if I am not guaranteed that there's somebody to sponsor me after one year, do I really want to spend the money if I'm not guaranteed? Because it's 750 rand per hour. What's that to how much revati per, per hour? Uh, $40 an hour, $50 an hour, or something like that. So it doesn't sound much, but every time they call, they're going to charge yeah. you. Yeah. And you're being charged for something you're not sure whether you will get the job. If you are guaranteed that after that one year of your critical skills visa, you have a job, by all means do it. And, and if you're in sciences, you're guaranteed you'll get a job. By all means, you can get a lawyer. But for me, in, who is in a general administration, I don't feel I want to spend money on a lawyer to do it for me. I would rather try and do it. And who knows, I can then offer the service to somebody else. <laughs> So, uh, 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 Maggie, this critical skills visa is not tied to the Black Economic, uh, uh, Economic Empowerment Commission, right? Uh, everybody of, has equal access if you're ex expatriate to the critical skills visa, correct? Yes as, okay. uh, yes, as long as you meet the criteria that they have set up. It has nothing to do with your, with your racial background. Okay. It's just your skills. Now, where the BE comes in is when you get, get somebody to sponsor you after that one year. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's where the rubber yeah. meets the road. But Barbara okay. might have something to say about that. Thank you. This is very, very helpful for anybody who's re relocating. Um, can I add to that? Sure. I'm here. I've been here about eight years. Um, I'm on the science route. I'm, I'm a doctor, actually. I think my, my summary with the whole situation is you can get a critical skills, but that does not guarantee that you will get a job. So if anyone who, who is planning to come here wants to work, my advice would be to apply independent of the whole diplomatic accompany spouse um, permit. So if you apply on your own for the critical skills and get the job on your own and then come in on your own, so it basically means you and your spouse will have two separate permits. I think people who have done that found it a bit easier. The moment you're an accompanied spouse, this is from personal experience, it limits, it limits what you can do 
in the country. And then you get to a point where they tell you um, you need to drop your accommodation of permit to be able to apply for another permit. So basically, you can't change your permit when you're in the country. So you need to leave the country, um, um, drop your diplomatic company spouse permit, and then apply for a permit you're not even sure you will get. So my advice to anyone who's coming in is to just apply independently for the critical skills, and then see if you can get a job on your own, and then come in um, outside of the diplomatic permit. You're on mute, Yvonne. You're still on mute. Very helpful uh, on employment path. So, Ravati, I was just wondering, uh, we had one question in the chat, whether uh, I will read that out and then you continue with whatever you have in, uh, uh, in mind. Sure. You're very patient. The no, question in the chat here is, how are the medical facilities and access to specialists? I would say it's very good. My son just had a little uh, minor surgery. It went very well despite the current situation. They were very careful about sanitizing everything and he's back home. Everything's fine. I myself have seen a doctor here, just a regular stuff, very uh, competent. Uh, many hospitals, many uh, doctors' offices here. Uh, I've been to a dentist already. Everything went well. So we've been very lucky in that sense. And there are many uh, avail good, uh, high standard, good quality um, services. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe, Gravity, you want to start now with your introduction. <laughs> All right. <laughs> 30 okay. minutes later. No, it's absolutely fine because this is an informal discussion. I but. know. And it's good because Maggie uh, really covered two major considerations, which is, which is schooling uh, and employment. Uh, everything, we all think about that, right? But I, was, I would say maybe lucky this is the first time we moved without our children. So it is very different for us. I didn't have to think at all about my children, about their schooling. <laughs> so it made it so much easier to move. But the, on the other side, of course, it was about uh, moving, being away from the children. That was a little uh, uh, difficult initially. We got used to that very quickly <laughs> and organizing trips for them and all that. So that was uh, a, it's a different uh, experience for us. Yeah. So uh, something to think about before coming here, uh, you know, all the talking about housing, all the listings are online. So unlike my, our previous two postings, I could already start looking at houses before coming here. And when I was uh, put in touch with the relocating people here, the agent and I, we exchanged links uh, after going uh, over the uh, criteria for housing. Uh, I sent her the kind of houses that we wanted, and she got an idea of uh, our taste, uh, what we were looking for, and that made the process so much easier. So when we came on pre-assignment, it was very quick, uh, three days looking at houses. There, were, there are many uh, options, of course, apartments and uh, standalone houses with yards, so depending on what you want, what you like. You like to be closer to the city. So one thing to think about here is because we, uh, we are with the World Bank, so the World Bank office is in Pretoria, and 30, 45 minutes away is Johannesburg, and IFC office is there. So you might you will have to decide then where you are going to be, right? And also schooling, where are you going to live uh, near the school or near the office? Uh, so that's uh, something to look at. And many of the houses they are you you can choose to live in uh, secure compounds, and they call it boom here. And so they've got this uh, alarm system, security guards, and all that, right? And your homes, if not, they also have uh, you know, electric fences, things like that, for you to feel safe in your house. Um, so that's the, um, uh, in terms of location, kind of houses that you want. And something that uh, came up recently is that um, right now with, uh, in, in South Africa, there isn't enough electricity to meet the demand of the consumers, right? So there's a lot of load shading going on. And uh, 
is scheduled and sometimes it's in, uh, in unscheduled interruptions as well. So something to talk to your agent about is uh, how's been generated. In fact, today on WhatsApp chat, we were talking about those things. Uh, generator or you're going to have an inverter or solar panel, that sort of thing. To, and maybe, I'm not sure, maybe some areas are more prone to load shading. They have more in a week than other places. So to remember to ask about that. And, and especially now, like this morning, it was freezing, freezing temperature. And I, I think some of our WBN members had to wake up to a cold house because without electricity, you can't turn on your heater. So uh, that's something we uh, have to deal with here. But otherwise, uh, you have many options for house, yeah? And it's very lush and green and, um, you know, close to walking or jogging or uh, exercise, hiking places. Revati, if I may, you yeah. mentioned the electric fans and the boom or the compounds. Boom. Boom. <laughs> boom. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you say a little bit more about security? I mean, uh, I suppose that if everything like that is in place, it, because there is a need, right? And I also sure. would like to, to hear in, 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 in Joanna's book about security and uh, day, daily life and kids hanging out uh, by themselves. How secure is it, please? Okay. Um, for me, you know, as with any other country with a big disparity, right, in quality, crime is there. And um, so the homes, in terms of the houses, uh, you know, you can have, uh, choose to have uh, security. I mean, you not, don't choose, you are expected to have security, either if you live in a compound, which is secure, or you have electric fence. So these are the options. And... Um, and they'll tell you know you have to be careful of about going out at night, to be cautious when you go grocery shopping. Where do you keep your handbag? In the car, you know, locked things like that. So I think for me it's not unusual because we lived in Nairobi as well and Madagascar and we had the same situation. So it was just you get used to uh, being uh, conscious when you go out. And uh, and children, I mean, I see we live in a compound and our kids are. Children are always playing outside, so you know within that area it's safe. I see teen teenagers in the malls all the time before the lockdown. That's it. Yeah, so I see a lot of young people hanging out in the malls. Lots of malls, world class malls and grocery supermarkets. Everything you can find, everything here. Although I'm missing Trader Joe's still a little bit, you know, but <laughs> you can find everything. And um, so it, it's. I mean, so far, we have had a great time here. Uh, with the lockdown, of course, it's, uh, we haven't been out so much. Um, but you want to go, um, you know, fun things to do. You can go to game parks. You can uh, go uh, to Cape Town, Table Mountain. I mean, this is a place of where tourists would love to come to, right? So you, I mean, you know, for the weekend, you can go somewhere and stay overnight and have a wonderful time apart from work and our studies. So I was coming back to uh, the um, electricity problem, the load shading. I wanted to say that with the lockdown now, uh, having to work from home and classes uh, being online, if you don't have Wi-Fi, wi it is a challenge right now. So I know some of our members are having a hard time with that, uh, especially this last four months under lockdown. We have a question in the chat, Ravathi, about uh -huh. the criteria, presumably the houses that you rent, either in Pretoria or Johannesburg, have to meet the, the criteria set by WBG security. Is that true? Is that still true? I mean, I know it was before, yes. but... Yeah, it is true, but I also know that of people who just say, no, I really like this house and I feel safe, you know, and they are confident and they say, I go ahead and take this house. So it's okay. You're not forced I add, to uh, follow. Uh, sure. Who, who, who wanted to, to, to add something? Please Hi. go ahead. Yes, it's Maki. Hi. So um, I, I, we're based in Johannesburg and I lived, we lived here for three years. And uh, 
Um, maybe the Rebati has lived in um, Madagascar and, and I think it was Kenya, you said? Um, so, Nairobi, um, yes. I, Nairobi, yeah. So she got, um, she has, uh, she got used to it and she take it. Um, so probably the transition is smooth for her. But coming, coming from uh, Europe, or a DC office, um, I would say that uh, you have to make a big adjustment in, in terms of the sense of security and sense of anxiety. Um, so living in a, a gated estate with a security measure in place, yes, we can hang around and we can have a life, but we still need to have a life and then our, our staff are commuting to offices every day, and on the way to the office, uh, there is a quite um, um, time uh, hijacking. Car hijacking is is happening quite uh, frequently. Um, it's 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 something. Even though we are being cautious and vigilant, and it, it's, it's something that we cannot completely avoid. So there's a chance that uh, you might get caught in uh, crime scenes um, and, and you get you get to hear a lot of news bad news is, and yeah you, it really um, take take a toll eventually and then with this uh, pandemic and then unemployment un unemployment rate is rising and then I see a more beggars like people are begging and then streets people are trying to um, sell stuff and there are lots of people on the streets so I, um, and then who we get a little bit more, we need to get more cautious about who's going to be the, there can be a criminal crime, um, hijackers and in, in one of the, among them. So in, in, in a sense, it's, it's a big adjustment and you have to be prepared for that. How I have a question with regard to when you put this these this whole idea of income inequality and the pandemic worsening the situation as it is I think in every country. Uh, what about teenagers and the world class malls? Uh, how how secure do you have teenagers? Do you feel both Mackey and uh, Rebate? I know you, your children are not with you, but generally in uh, Pretoria. Uh, comfortable about the children, uh, teenagers hanging out and going out on their own. So I, um, it's a personal experience. It's it's just probably an unfortunate uh, uh, experience that happened to a family. It's it's not it it wasn't something um, very serious. But uh, when last weekend my my family, uh, my husband took uh, children. To get ice cream at the the shopping mall, which is considered to be the most beautiful and the most secure shopping mall in this neighborhood in Joburg, and then he unfortunately encountered a uh, active shooter. So there's a armed robbery um, uh, was uh, attacked a jewelry house and they're they're on the loose. So. Um, Unfortunately, our family encountered those scenes, and then he needed to evacuate it to a shop, to a store. But with the small children, he was a little bit um, late in taking action. So by the time he realized it, he was he and my my children are left alone in the hallway where all their stores are shutting down and locked, and and it was a very scary situation. So even though with uh, security measure in place and then armed guards are everywhere, still it happens. So it's just it's just a possibility that you you cannot be hundred percent secure no matter what, no matter where you are. So just I'll just keep keep it I'll suggest us keep in mind that it could happen anywhere. Yeah, it's true. It could even happen that <laughs> yeah, in the U.S. where there's uh, no gun control. Uh, so uh, Beverly asks, do spouses get a security briefing from the uh, U.N. or WBG security? Uh, yes. So they ask for a meeting as soon as you arrive. 
a medical um, briefing and as well as a security briefing. You have can ask all your questions and yeah, so it's there. Hi, Myra. I just saw <laughs> Myra from South Africa, good friend in Washington DC. <laughs> Yes. So, I mean, just Sorry, to Ravati, uh, can I ask, Ravati, uh, sure. the security briefing and the medical briefing is mandatory for staff and spouse? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. But anyway, maybe we can sw switch gear to a slightly uh, a lighter tone. <laughs> and then come back come back again yes, to, I can to talk the about other that. thing. <laughs> is what is fun and unique about living in South Africa? I know it's extremely beautiful in the vineyards and the safari park. That's for me, the game park. But what else, you know, can you tell us, those of you, and many of you have been there for a long time, you know, 8, 11 years. What's fun and unique about living in South Africa? Barbara, are you there? Would you like to share something? I'm here, yes. Okay, am I on? Probably. Yes. I feel the same. Great. Okay. <laughs> yes, for me, the wildlife is definitely a big draw point. I um, I love the African bush. Otherwise, you know, they say that South Africa is the world in one country. It's unbelievable what you can experience, where you can go, from desert to shark diving, if you are adventurous. There's so much to do touristy wise Another thing that I think is unique in South Africa is people have a saying here, we'll make a plan. And South Africans are making plans all the time because things are not going according to wishes or plans or whatnot. So you have to make a plan B or C or D or whatever. And I find that in, in that way, South Africans are very adaptable and they kind of, they get unnerved, of course, with these stupid locks, uh, with these stupid um, power outages and whatnot. But you get over it, you make a plan. You get together with us, for instance, in the neighborhood, you know, people on our Facebook group, they offer, you can come to me and charge you, your devices and whatnot. So planning and uh, make a plan, get over it, get on that way, South African. And I like that. South Africans smile a lot. They are, you know, but wherever they come from, they have unbelievable humor and it is such a lively and vibrating place. I really enjoy it. it. For me, we've been here for 14 years. I have permanent residency um, with my family, but it's still exciting. We just, we love it. It's a different, uh, different experience. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can, that, 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 that's great. <laughs> And uh, uh, we have uh, from Myra here in the chat that, uh, to support Barbara. She's saying uh, that's another saying in South Africa, everything will work out. I'm yeah. not sure I can read, uh, talk, uh, speak the Afrikaans, but anyway, uh, every, uh, everything uh, will work out. So um, if we go back to, to living in South Africa then, how would you compare Johannesburg and Pretoria. I mean, not that our families will have a choice, or, or, or can they choose? Do people live in Pretoria and work in Johannesburg? You go on that train, right? Yes. So uh, I know families who are with the World Bank and they travel from Johannesburg because they prefer to live there. And uh, we were a few of them were encouraging us to find a house in Johannesburg. <laughs> But this time we decided, no, it's easy. You know, since uh, my husband has always traveled to work because of the school, we chose to live near the school. Uh, this time we decided to be in Pretoria. So really, you know, uh, you can choose wherever, whichever works for you. So, uh, Barbara, you're the love stayer. Are there pros and cons that you would advise uh, somebody who's just coming in and they say, well, wow, you know, we can go by train. <laughs> 
So which one do we take? What would you say? I would say don't count on the train. <laughs> Public transport here is, is not that great. Yes, the train is very modern and it is very safe, but you get out of the train and where are you? You know, are you really close to your home? Are you really close to your office? Because there's one train with I don't know I don't I don't know. Let's just estimate like seven seven uh, stations. It's not a, a normal train that you would expect, like um, like the metro kind of, of train. So I wouldn't bank on the train. Usually here you drive a car. Simple as that. Public transport, apart from that how train, you can basically forget about it. It's not safe. Doesn't take you places. You need you need to drive. You need a car, or you can use. Ubers, that's also very popular. When it comes to, to comparing Pretoria and Johannesburg, I think Johannesburg has a slight advantage in that maybe about the white people said you might think about living in Joburg. And there's uh, two things. First of all, Joburg, at least in our area, is English speaking. Pretoria is Afrikaans speaking. It is pure and pure Afrikaans. And many people find that difficult to adapt. They say, I, I meet others, but I can't really communicate because they talk Afrikaans in between themselves. And the other point is that many people choose to send their children to the American school, especially in high school. But high school is only in Joburg. Pretoria has a prep school and middle school, but the high school children from Pretoria take the bus and come to Johannesburg to, um, to the American school, high school. So these how are these that bus trip, though? If I lived in Pretoria, how long would my kids have to be on the bus? It's actually not that bad. It's a good half an hour around that. The, the school is pretty close to the highway. So it's not that much of an issue, but again, it depends in a bit where where you live. But uh, if you live in Joburg, usually it, it is a bit a bit closer. It is a bit easier also for you because you you know how it is as a mom. Every now and then you do go to school, even though there is a bus um, service. So Ravati, how have you found this? Uh what Barbara was saying that many people speak of the language of business is Afrikaans. How have you found that? Well, like I said, I've been at home most of this <laughs> under lockdown, <laughs> but the times that I have been out, uh, there hasn't been an issue. So I'm speaking, I can only speak English to others, so uh, I haven't had any difficulties. Uh, they look at me and they speak to me in English. So <laughs> I think they see that they know I don't speak Afrikaans. So it's not an issue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mainly heard that from from embassy employees. You know, for instance, from the Swiss embassy, and right. Afrikaans yeah. and, and German are quite similar in a way. So I do understand some Afrikaans, and I can read some. I can understand when I read it a bit. But I heard from the Swiss embassy that people said, "Oh my God, you socialize and talk in Afrikaans." <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Pamimi has a question, and there's a question in the box, in, in the chat box. Shall I, uh, which way would you like to go, Pamimi? Your question in the chat box or chat box in you? Uh, well, my question kind of got answered when Barbara said that. I was going to ask where Barbara is from originally, and I guess I heard her saying Germany. So uh, that answered my question because. I was curious to note that, you know, there is um, quite a range of uh, experiences or perception of feeling of feeling comfortable in uh, South Africa when I compare Maki, Maki's uh, view to Barbara's view. So I was just curious to know um, why there is such a you know, obviously Barbara has been here for 14 years and you said you've become a permanent resident. Maki did mention that there are um, 
quite a few incidents of, uh, you know, that involve your security and that makes her feel uncomfortable. So maybe Barbara, you can tell us a little bit about what makes you feel secure despite some of these incidents that happen. What makes me feel secure is that I follow the rules. And it was mentioned that there is a safety briefing. We didn't have that because we already lived here when my husband started working for IFC. And I think if you follow the rules, you are at least halfway there. Because, for instance, my husband twice did not follow the rules, and that was when he was still smoking, he left his, his car window open just about that much. But that was enough for someone to come put his hand on and say, you open that window and give me your phone or I'll shoot you. So, of course, he handed over his phone. Or the second time was when he parked, uh, they had a farewell party, he parked his car and he left his computer bag visible and someone broke the window. So, as Marky said, these things do happen here. And, um, and there's often violence involved, which I'm not used to. I'm actually Swiss, German speaking. <laughs> and in, in Switzerland, someone breaks into your house when you're not there. And they steal your stuff and they disappear. And it's very, very uncomfortable, obviously. But you're not in danger. Whereas here, you must understand that people break into your house while you're there. They might shoot you. They might stop you in your in your driveway and say, "Open your gate for me. Take me in. I'm gonna I'm gonna rob you. I'm gonna take your car and whatnot." So there's a lot of violence involved here. Or like Marky also mentioned, you know, a shootout in in the in the mall that is unheard of in Switzerland. But here, yes, it it does happen. I've been here for 14 years. I was never, ever in a situation where I didn't feel, where I felt uncomfortable and unsafe, but I am not someone who is very anxious uh, to start with. Thank and you, Barbara. Thank you. One of, maybe one of the big rules is live in a safe place. Yeah. Make sure you live in what was mentioned in a boomed area or an estate. So Marky and I, we live in the same estate. It's like a village that is surrounded by a wall. Within you have the golf course, nature reserves. You can walk. My teenagers can, can walk around, meet their friends by themselves. And I would really recommend that with that, for instance, you can avoid Coming home late, in the dark, standing in your driveway, waiting for your gate to open and someone jumps out and, um, and attacks you, robs you, hijacks you, whatever. That is, that is a big thing in my opinion. I think, you know, given that Barbara said she didn't have the security briefing, the bank security briefings that they give are very up to date based on what has recently happened, and they do keep you informed. So if you are moving, uh, our security team does a very, very good job, uh, both with uh, the security of the house, you can get them to look over the property if you would like, and also to attend the briefing, uh, which I think is important, as, as Barbara said, to follow the, the advice that they give you on, on what to do uh, and, and not to do. So uh, I have uh, two questions for the South African uh, panel, I would say now, uh, uh, Barbara, Mackey, and Reverty. Uh, the questions are here, two of them, and I'll call them out. What groups and activities are there to join? And another question is, are you, are, are you all moving only in expat circles, or do you have South African friends? Over to the panel, as it were. Uh, Revedi here. Hmm. So, um, as I said, uh, I haven't gone out to make too many friends right now. My friends are still my old friends from the country that I moved here from on Zoom and all that. But, uh, yes, I have got to know a few people. And um, 
There are volunteer opportunities out there, lots of them, if you like that. And uh, I'm sure, like, through the schools, you can, uh, there are PTA friends that you can um, uh, do organized activities with. And, um, uh, and of course, there are, the, the are expat groups that uh, walk and all that. I've got to know some of my neighbors through, like, uh, yoga classes. So it really depends where you are and who you reach out to. And I suppose there are many uh, groups, but uh, I think Maki and uh, Barbara might uh, be able to add on to that. And we also have, I can't read your name quite, uh, uh, is the lady who is the doctor also. Hi, it's, it's, oh, yeah. Lee. <laughs> it's Lee. It's Lee, hi. hi. Yes. Well, please join the panel. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll just like to add, I don't know if I mentioned, but I've been here about eight years now. Um, so with respect to security, I think um, just to add to what Barbara said, obviously I got the security training from the, from the office and then um, also making use of the security guys. They come in, they look at the property, they, they, they advise you on how to, what security upgrades you need to do also helps. And then we um, engage the services of private security companies. So that's also an option here, where you have your you have your electric fence, you have your house, your home alarm systems, you have cameras in the house, and all of that connected to a private security company. So if um, um, your alarm goes off, they they call on you to check if everything is okay. They come into the property to make sure everything is fine. If you're going to travel and you inform them ahead, then they know there's no one in the house. Then they, they take extra extra care. So this, this is usually quite popular during the Christmas holidays where people are out of town. And then I haven't used this personally because I don't go out at night, but I think some of them offer like an escort service. So if you have to go out late at night, they would provide a security car to, to drive behind you when you're going home, make sure you're home safe before the leave. I, obviously, it would be an extra cost, but I know of friends who have had to use them, um, especially when they had to go out at night. So, yeah, that's been quite helpful because my husband travels a lot. So being here alone with the kids and all of that, it's just nice to have that, um, that option as well. I'm not sure if the office subsidizes that or anything, but yeah, they've been quite, we've, we've used them since we're here. And then the other thing is the area where you stay is quite important. So I think the security um, team will also advise you on the areas where you should consider living in the neighborhoods. Um, and I think also um, living in like a complex, so they call it, they call it a complex where you have um, 10, 15, 20 houses in, a, in, a, in an enclosed area, so you have like security guards and all of that. People, people tend to favor that arrangement as against living in a standalone house where you're just um, open to the road. So um, yeah, I think the neighborhood is important. Following the rules, when you're driving, make sure there's nothing in sight. So your handbag, everything in the boot, um, um, when you are when you are at the, the what they call them robots here, the traffic stop, you have to be very very vigilant because someone can just come and um, break your windows, especially when they see something attractive in the car. So yeah, like Barbara said, just follow the rules, don't let your guard down, and just be very very vigilant, and you'll be fine. So I I haven't thankfully I haven't had any incidents since I moved here. Yeah, that's it. So is there anything else uh, uh, the uh, panel want to add? Uh, we obviously the great testament to life in South Africa is that we have many long stays, eight, 14 years, eight years. Uh, that bears witness that in spite of everything, uh, there's something great and drawing uh, and uh, uh, attractive about uh, living in Africa. 
So thank you, Olga. One last question to end on a high note before I uh, uh, give it as a uh, mini to uh, round us off is what is the best thing about living in South Africa? So uh, everyone from the panel, please, one <laughs> thing from each one of you. What is the best thing about living in South Africa? Uh, I, I'd say that uh, here the, they call South Africa the rainbow nation. <laughs> so I totally blend in, and there's lots of culture, different cultures, mm -hmm. and I know despite the history, people are still trying to make it work, and there's just so much to be involved in, you know, mm -hmm. so I like that. Mm -hmm. For me, it's nature. What I like most of the country is nature, the the climate in, in um, Pretoria and in Johannesburg is fantastic. We have more than eight hours of sun per day um, in average. It does rain a lot, same as London, but it pours and that's it, over and done with. So you can do a lot of outdoor um, activities. For instance, I go horse riding, love that. Uh, South Africans are very sporty. That's the thing. I love most. It's a beautiful, beautiful country, beautiful scenery. You can go out. Nature is fantastic. And I'm not even mentioning the African animals. <laughs> Mighty, Ed Lee? Yes. Um, I, previously, I com my comments are pretty much like negative, uh, showing the negative aspects about um, South Africa. And, um, but uh, looking at the bright side, um, yeah, South Africa has the most beautiful nature and scenery, and then it's it's uh, it's the most beautiful place in this continent, I think. So a lot of people travel all over to South Africa to get um, it, it, to get to experience um, from safari to oceans to mountains is very beautiful and then living in the estate um, it looks like it's a be it, it, it looks it's amazing well maintained and uh, all the sports activities are quite affordable compared to one in the states or Europe you can uh, take advantage of those luxurious lifestyle in a very affordable price, which is a very mm -hmm. uh, benefit of living in South Africa. So I think um, there's a, of course, um, negative aspect in them, and a good, there's a very positive aspect of South Africa. But I think uh, living in here, I think the best thing is to just, yeah, um, try to look at the bright side and uh, take advantage of the time while we are here. So. Comment. Last comment. Thank you, Maki. Lee? Lee? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. No, I was saying that it's, it's a beautiful country. Um, you would find some there's something for everyone. So whatever your your um, hobbies are, whatever your like your likes are, you would find there's something for you to do, and something for you to experience. And I think um I also love the diversity, especially in Johannesburg. So like you meet people from different backgrounds, all colors. <laughs> so it's really rainbow, um, a rainbow nation. Yeah. So yeah, for me that's it. It's it's actually a very beautiful country. Thank you. Yeah. So over to you, Pamili, to wrap up. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, I would really like to commend all the speakers today, uh, the panel of uh, Revati, Maggie, Maki, Barbara, Lee, uh, for joining us and making this presentation really, really honest, uh, comprehensive. We covered everything from work to schools to housing to security and activities and the way in which people connect with each other. And I thought, I think we got a really good picture. And that's what these sessions are about. 
uh, an honest uh, look at a posting in that country. So, Maki, thank you for sharing your views honestly as well. And, um, you know, despite everything, obviously, I can see that all of you are really engaged. All of you are in different ways making the most of your stay over there. And um, thank you for that as well, having that positive spirit. And above all, thank you to all our uh, audience today. Thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you again for our future sessions. And thank you, Yvonne, for guiding us skillfully, as always. Thank you. So next week, everybody, we're going to Uganda. So if you are interested, next week, Uganda. So we look forward uh, to, to hearing. And for those of you who are moving, you've met now many members of the South African chapter. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And goodbye. Bye -bye.